Welcome to the Ketogenic Diet Show. My name is Mary Beauchamp, and I'll be your hostess. Let's begin by taking a deep breath together. Take a moment to bring your awareness system into your body and into the present moment. Listen deeply to what your body has to say, because your body has all of the answers, and it's your job to tune in and listen. Your thoughts your emotions, your feelings, and your actions are all instructing your immune system. In this podcast, I'll be exploring the history of human evolution, cultural anthropology, food systems, and the scientific literature, looking at patterns that can give us great insight into how we can live our lives today in a more aligned, integrated, and sustainable way. Here, I attempt to bridge the gap between the science and spirituality of self-healing. This is a process that requires deep self-reflection, which can lead to self-empowerment. My mission is to help as many people as I can to connect with their inner guidance system so that they can make truly informed decisions about their health. And in that process, they can awaken their body's innate intelligence to heal and thrive. When your mind and body are aligned, you are the boss of your emotional and physical health. Taking control of your health is a spiritual journey that requires you to look at what you eat as well as what is eating you. And when you do this, you can take the prescription pen out of your doctor's hand and write your own ticket to wellness. So now that you're fully present in your body, sit back, relax, and enjoy this information. See how it speaks to your body. Feel in and see how your body receives it. When the truth reveals itself to you, it will resonate in your body and you will know it. Then you can act accordingly based on the information you receive. It is totally possible to give your body messages that will consciously relay information to your biochemistry that can support your health and happiness. Today, I want to introduce a very special guest her name is Allison McQuinn. She's a practicing Heilkunst physician for over 16 years, which is a 200-year-old system of cure based on the principles of like cures like. She supports patients around the world to find relief of allergies, arthritis, heart disease, cancer, and much more. Allison specializes in the emotional and physical care of women and children, helping them to discover their essential self and resolve trauma that forms the basis of physical and emotional illness. She is the author of over 25 books. Her books can be found on Amazon, and she also offers a free audiobook called The Path to Cure, The Whole Art of Healing, which can be found at thepathtocure.com backslash bonus. She also has a free audiobook called The Eight Steps to Natural Fertility Your Doctor Doesn't Know About, which can be found on her website, www.arcanum.com. Dot ca backslash the number eight steps. That's www.arcanum.ca backslash the number eight steps. So my name is Allison McQuinn, and, and I'm a doctor of Heilkunst medicine, the mother of two children that are grown adults now. And I have written about 25 books and have been supporting my own patients for 21 years um, as of June and um, really helping them with uh, regimen, including nutrition and um, sequential approach to homeopathy to resolve chronic disease issues and then also a counseling component as well. I met you, Mary, because a friend of ours uh, introduced you by inviting you to supper one night at our house here in Guanajuato, Mexico. And um, I was carrying quite a bit of extra weight. And it was interesting because I said, well, I, I live on keto. How cool is it that you're a keto coach? And I wanted to find out so much more about your practice. And in that found where I probably was failing. And, you know, it's always best for the physician to treat thyself, but not by thyself. <laughs> so, yeah, 
when you um, suggested that we get together and discuss what might have been my missing links, I was um, well beguiled and I feel that it was fate that you were brought into my realm. And so, yeah, as soon as you pulled out that little meter that you check ketones and blood glucose, I thought, oh shit, um, look at that. And so, yeah, sugars and glycemic level were quite high um, issues. I was not in ketosis, uh, although I have not eaten grains or wheat uh, probably in 20 years, uh, lots of vegetables, probably about 80% vegetables and, you know, uh, a cacophony of meat and fish, um, but also these great little treats that I used to make very regularly with almond flour and monk fruit or erythritol and, you know, all kinds of yummy fat bombs and fat bagels. And I was having a grand old romp staying at exactly the same weight or even gaining a smidge uh, each year. And so when I recognized uh, that I had put on probably about 35 pounds over the last um, couple of decades sitting for hours and hours at a time and only doing about an hour and a half to two hours of exercise six days a week, I wasn't pushing the needle anywhere. Yeah. And that's a lot of physical activity that you were doing. And in, in the keto world, you were doing everything right. You know, it looked right on paper and it felt like you were doing all the, the hard things to try to get the weight off. Mm -hmm. And typically what happens is I hear people say, oh, I've been doing keto for, you know, six months and it's not working. Yeah. And so my job's always kind of been to investigate like what, where's the missing link? Why isn't this working for you? Yeah. And we figure it out together. Right. And I, I, I remember telling you at dinner that night, I said, well, if your goal is to lose weight and you've been doing this for two years and you haven't lost the weight, you're something's wrong. Like let's yeah. dive in and check this out. And I'm happy to do that for you. So yeah. we've just, we've just been having so much fun, Allie. And I mean, <laughs> since the first time we met, um, you've just been so compliant and so willing to learn and, and so committed to this process that it's just been a joy to watch you do all the things with never complaining and never whining. And, you know, it's been, it's just been a lot of fun. So I so appreciate your willingness and your perseverance and just your great attitude and, and being, being the boss, you know, you <laughs> You, you are the boss of your metabolism right now. And it's just fantastic to see. Yeah, um, tell I, us I am now, but I wasn't for a very long time. And every time you said to me, Mary, oh, Allie, you've got this. I think she's full of it. Like there's <laughs> no way in this God's creation I got this because I really had lost faith because I had been seeing love like so many practitioners, fellow practitioners, trainers. I had this really hot, well, I think I've gone through three trainers now that I think about it. Their answer was always oatmeal. And I'm like, the oatmeal doesn't work. And, and you know, the, the, that's the thing is I, I had tried so many approaches. I really felt quite forsaken. And deep down, even though I was kind of your fun, loving, compliant gal, deep down, I had a lot of pain, because I really couldn't shake it. You know, I, I really thought there was something extremely broken. And for one physician to say that to another therapist is a big deal. Because, you know, that, that took me to the nub, you know, I was, I was really deeply um, in a lot of angst and a lot of pain deep down. And so how much weight have you lost? <laughs> well, I got gargantuan 35 pounds. <laughs> Yay. Awesome. Yay. That yeah. is such uh, an accomplishment. Yeah. It's so yeah. Started awesome. at 186.3 and I'm down to 152 this morning. Maybe the numbers don't add up. My math is not my strong suit, but in around there, 32, 35. Yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's awesome. So proud of you. Congratulations. It's Thank very you. exciting. Yeah. And you look amazing. 
I mean, your whole face has changed. Your whole body has changed. You're just Meta- metamorphosizing. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> pleased. Like, I can't even tell you, I wear my shirts tucked in now. And, 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 you know, after 25, 30 years of not being able to do that, that's huge. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, just noticing that my pelvis is properly, you know, in her hammock now, mm-hmm. whereas I was always, because I was compensating for a larger thyroidal belly, um, you know, that my, my pelvis was tilted back, which meant that my sex organs were also misplaced. And so by everything coming back into alignment, it has changed not just my endocrine system, but also all my organ habitat as well. So yeah, a lot of that internal working, I, you know, knew that that was possible, but actually achieving it is a whole other level. Right. And can you, can you say any more about, about that in terms yeah. of what you've noticed in your pelvis and your sexual organs and your, yeah, well, it, yeah, it, it's super, super important, like with the way that you move through the world. And that's the thing, you know, you got me to get those great little shoes where my toes are all splayed like a little tree frog now. And, um, yeah, super adorable. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and it has changed like my whole alignment because I was super heavy in my thighs. Like I always looked like I had a biker's posture um, because my thighs were really super thick um, and still remain an area that I'm still uh, working on taking weight off. Um, but then also my abdomen, I had this pouch uh, after a C-section and then of course gaining weight just exacerbated that. And because of the pelvic tilt back, it gave me more of a sway back and it was causing a lot of reverberated pain up into my shoulders and my neck. Um, and so, yeah, when uh, the elbows connected to the knee joint and all of that, it was actually causing a lot of misalignment in my whole body. Mm. And have you noticed changes in your hormones at all with that? Well, yeah, because I was always uh, burning sugar and not realizing, of course, there's 5,000 regulating chemicals and hormones in the body. If you're always burning off sugar, I was always feeling unsupported emotionally. And this was kind of a key component of my own um, trauma in my life. And so thank God you were the type of practitioner that really understood how to weave you know, not just the physical aspects, but the mental, emotional, and spiritual aspects as well, because I never divorced those two in my own practice. And of course, I couldn't and didn't want to divorce the physical aspect of my endocrine system and what it means to be always in a sugar burning mode. So when I started to get down into true ketogenesis, this is what I found was that, oh, I don't have to eat every two to three hours that I can actually go through my fasts feeling supported on broth alone. And this changed a lot, not just in my endocrine system, but also in my mental, emotional um, stability and scaffolding. Um, It it changed. It was a game changer on all levels. And, And that's the thing is I wonder, you know, how many people like me are living in chronic inflammation and always just um, buzzing up at the top, within the, the glycemic index, but never getting into that more um, supportive scaffolding of the slow grind sleeping through the night. That's another area that was never possible for me. I'd always be up for a pee at least uh, once or twice every night. And it just felt like I was kind of chronically fatigued and really, um, like my my hormones, uh, because I think like the sugar and the estrogen have a real um, party together. I was always at this kind of buzzy, wired, almost like a ADHD kind of buzzy, edgy, um, pissy. It wouldn't take much for me to 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 be agitated, aggravated. Um, you know, even enraged, I could go from zero to 800 if provoked. And that's the thing is all of that has really changed. 
as I'm much more settled now in my sex organs, which sounds odd. So I have, we haven't really talked about this, but I think like the sugar caused me to stay up more in my intellect. And now I feel so much like the freight elevator has gone down and I'm living now more from my seat and my sex organs where, you know, really if, if we're uh, having big thoughts, they infuse the intellect with information, but, you know, choice is actually down in our bellies. And the true place to navigate from feels to me as if the ketogenic diet and your guidance, of course, has helped me to really displace all of the noise of the sugar and really get down into my loins where I should be navigating from. Ah, oh, that is so beautifully said. I love that. <laughs> so it sounds to me like you're, what you're saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you have come from sort of operating more in an, in an um, ethereal space to being more grounded in your body with running on ketones as opposed to glucose. Yes, well said. And that's the thing I think is that my, the inflammation in my body was in my brain because I was suffering migraines. I don't say that to too many people. As a physician, we're not supposed to have symptoms. You don't, you know. And so, yeah, I was suffering periodic migraines, which I didn't know what set them off. And I realized like coffee was a trigger. So what was happening, and you know this from doing so much research in physiology and anatomy, is that if something comes in that creates inflammation, what happens then is the symptoms in the body, right, react in the area of the body where the challenges are. So I had so much off gas and glucose in my brain that you send in something that creates expansion. And of course, I couldn't handle that because I was already so full of inflammation. And, yeah. you know, so trying to be on true keto where, you know, I have that little romp uh, with a stimulant with, um, you know, full cream and a bit of monk fruit was a freaking disaster for me because I was so full tripping the lights fantastic from my belly inflammation, my abdominal inflammation, the inflammation in my pancreas, right, right up to fatty liver. I mean, I was a freaking disaster. And I couldn't figure out how to resolve it at its root. And so when we started the ketone diet, of course, I was like, thrilled because I could have a bit of decaf coffee with full fatted cream and monk fruit. It was the urethritol, as you know, that we discovered. You're like, okay, what else is in that monk fruit? You're such an investigative, you know, physician. And I love that about you because you really caused me to pause instead of doing anything by default. So this was so interesting to me. And then I was cutting out everything and getting back just to eggs um, you know, organ meat, um, fish. And you said, well, you still got glycemic index in here. And I'm for the love of God, what could it possibly be? I cut out fruit, everything. And you said, I think it's the vegetables. And even though you and I were having such a fun romp in person, you never heard the names I called you after I got home. <laughs> uh, like vegetables, are you freaking kidding me? And of course you were right. So I took out everything, got back, you know, pretty much to fasting, broth, organ meat, um, fish and eggs. And that was it for actually quite a number of weeks. And oh my God, like I really met kind of the meat of myself. Like my, my husband jokes, he's also a fellow Heil Kunstler physician and he says, you know, vegetarians really have to realize that there's one truth, and that is they're made from meat. <laughs> <It's> so, <laughs> they're made from meat. You have to kind of go back to factory settings. And this is where I was having to go back to factory settings in a way that I never imagined. And of course, I started getting bodacious results as a result. And so, yeah, your science was spot on and yeah, left me kind of um, like just stunned, really. <laughs> oh, that's great. 
Yeah. Sometimes we have to dive into the details to discover what it is that's causing this. And that's why most of the time, you know, if people are willing and able, the best way to go about this journey, which I have discovered sort of the hard way with meeting many people like yourself, is that people don't come to me when they're doing okay with keto. They come to me when they're, you know, struggling and frustrated. And um, often the answer to that is to eliminate all plants and, mm -hmm. and to go back to the, the basic dietary protocol of what we would call the, the gut healing protocol, essentially. And that means no plants because plants have compounds in them that can inflame the gut. And that's where this inflammation begins is in the digestive tract. Yeah. And I know that you had some responses to certain foods that you could actually feel after you would eat them in your thyroid. And so that was really interesting to me. And so we dove into that for a little bit. Do you have any more that you might want to add to, to that for people that may be struggling with thyroid challenges? Cause this is really important. Yeah. Well said. And, and that's the thing, even the, the women that I serve, mostly women with thyroid uh, issues, it's rampant. And, and the interesting thing is I was doing thyroid dynam supplements, had been taking, um, you know, uh, iodine uh, for Lugol's for years, nascent iodine, taking lots of kelp. And I was, um, you know, in selenium to help myself absorb, like I knew the protocols and that's the most interesting part for me is that, um, yeah, I was playing by all the rules seemingly, and I still was having thyroid challenges. And of course it, it boiled down to the fact that I was not metabolizing my sugar well, because my thyroid was exhausted and my pancreas was incredibly inflamed. Um, along with my liver. And so everything was kind of like not booted up and not designed to burn fat. I had exhausted those organs and hormones for such a long period of time that they basically, you know, like a, a dog rolled over on their back and said, you know, I give up. There's, um, I'm not getting what it is that I need, which is the rest. Mm. And so any kind of vegetable, and we've talked about this because I surmise that perhaps it may be that everything is GMO'd in the plant world. And I have a premise that as I was really observing myself, because it's like the elimination diet that you did with me, you know, like a, a child that comes in with allergies. I've got an allergy. Okay, well, let's eliminate this, eliminate that until finally I was right down to four, four food groups and three of them were the same. I, I pretended they were more food groups than they were so I could try and mentally get myself through the challenge. But that was the thing is that taking me back to kind of factory settings, I really realized how triggered I was even by, by low glycemic. Um, veg, uh, veg, vegetables, um, which were was a problem and shocking um, to me, even that um, things like broccoli and, um, you know, calabasa, which is um, zucchini, was still still a trigger when, you know, in keto realm, they were supposed to be kosher for me and turned out not so much. Now, I've recently, just to, to reassure our friends uh, online, at this particular juncture, I am able to bring vegetables back in and I'm eating, you know, salads and, and, and vegetables and doing just fine and still able to hit ketogenesis and, and bring and manage my weight down through, you know, I've been doing that for about two months now that I'm within four to six pounds and I can just toggle her because I get it now um, where the triggers were. But I, I have the opportunity even to have, um, you know, a little keto dessert once every, even once a week or two weeks. And I'm still able, you know, like a ninja to pull back and then fast for so many hours or even a day or two and just, you know, bring my back myself back into a fat burning pattern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's beautiful because you are the boss. Now you have mastered your metabolic function and you have the tools in place to be able to monitor and manage and understand that language that your body is speaking to you. 
and you know how to speak back to it, the messages that you need to, to get the results that you want. And that is so profound. And that's really what I want to teach everybody is that you, you can become the master of your metabolism. And it's, it's not anything that I can do for you, but mm -hmm. that you have to learn to do for yourself. And yeah. once you master that, it's beautiful and you yeah. don't need me anymore. And it's fabulous. <laughs> Every good system of medicine should end in firing the physician. Absolutely. Right? Yes, I know. I and, and it never happens in, in allopathy. It's, you know, they want clients for life. And that's what I think I'm so thankful for is that, you know, I couldn't figure out where my blind spots were. And, and you very adroitly and, and lovingly uh, did that, not just on the level of science that really uh, enabled me to understand, um, but also with great compassion and nurturing and love. And that's probably another aspect that we should uh, delve into is that where some of my big emotional challenges were um, that I was super surprised to bump into old childhood trauma that as a, a woman, um, I was terrified of getting to my very bodacious, curvaceous self from my early years as a child when I was 12 and 13 being catcalled um, by men at construction sites. Well, isn't it amazing that at 58 years old, I actually bump in to some of that content as we're peeling back my weight layers to find some of that content, the criticism, you know, of my stepmother um, being treated as a sex object where my, um, you know, construction workers, boyfriends, I mean, I, there was a, a young, well, he wasn't young at the time, he was 18, driving by in a Trans Am you know, cat calling at me like, oh, baby, you're gorgeous. I'm 12 years old, mm. you know, and that my stepmother is like, yeah, you're dressed like a salt slut. You need to change those clothes. And my father just shut down. He never paid any attention to me anymore, really um, with affection or love or nurturing. Like you couldn't touch a girl that's budding with breasts and, you know, sex organs and all the rest of it. And I couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Mm. So I had developed a big, fat, juicy belief, which was that it's dangerous to be spelt. Like it causes you danger to be slim. You know, and even my best friend here in Mexico would call me flaquita. And I'm like, what does that mean? And she said, skinny, beautiful and skinny. And I felt myself like clench inside. And that was affection or attention from another woman. It's different in Mexico. They don't, it's not a bad thing to talk about somebody's weight. We don't associate like in, in the States and Canada, we don't associate with that negative. Like we talk about it very openly and I'm trying to be more like that, but there's still this kind of, this, there was this closet clench inside of me of like a deep-seated fear and terror so a few weeks ago you came down and we did a session um in my place that you really helped me unlock that content and a lot of that is building that safety in a curvaceous attention receiving way and not to interpret it as terror or negative. And this was cementing my inability to take off the last 12 pounds I had um, wanted to take off uh, for quite some time. And I was plateaued significantly. Yes, I remember that. And I knew that there was something we needed to dive into to figure out what was going on because we had fine tuned things to the T. And yeah. then we came to this this and, and yet another plateau. And this is where you have to just be so persistent and consistent and determined really to get beyond whatever it is that's blocking you. And it doesn't always have to be what's on your plate yeah. necessarily. And that is what we were able to really peel back some additional layers to get down into what was going on and 
emotionally for you and what stories you were running and telling yourself that were preventing you from really reaching your goals. And this, this goes back into our subconscious in such a deep way. Like you said, things came up that you remembered from when you were 12 Mm -hmm. and that were very traumatic and devastating. And when you begin to reach that same point in your body form as you were then, these things are going to come back up. And it's so fascinating um, to me. And I find it to be integral to the process of moving and pushing through that. So I just want to recognize your courage and your bravery and how much that is needed um, in these times when we we simply can't emotionally push back or push through um, our plateaus. And you were willing to go there. And that's really what it takes. And I'm always available to be witness to people's process when they're willing to go deeply into their emotional material and discover what it is that they're telling themselves. So I so appreciate your willingness and courage, Allie, in doing that. Thank you. Such my pleasure. And again, too, as a trauma therapist, I wouldn't be worth my salt if I didn't do this work myself. And like I said, I was the most surprised out of uh, any of us that that content still lay dormant um, down there and came up for my uh, not so viewing pleasure. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and that was the thing is that you just very lovingly and adroitly held me. And obviously I felt safe enough to do that uh, work with you at that juncture, the timing was uh, pristine. And um, yeah, and that's, I, I also think I got the co- very clear message that you were going to hold me through that process when I sensed that coming up because of your book. I mean, you had done such a beautiful and bodacious job of not just categorizing and explaining the science behind ketogenic um, dieting um, and the approach on such a a clear level, uh, but you also went into the whole, this is how you work with the emotions that are going to come up. These are the rituals that you can um, uh, um, use in your life that help you to actually clearly excavate that aspect which i think is missing so much from any dieting protocol which we all know um fails miserably in the face of you know people always almost always gain the weight back um because they will inherently um just re-invoke the same old patterns over and over and over again which breeds a whole lot of demoralization and psychic pain, I'm not good enough, I'm not smart enough, I'm a loser, I keep, you know, putting the weight back on, and it's a horrible place of, you know, patterning, because we don't do that adroitly enough as physicians and coaches resolve the root cause, which of course, is mental, emotional, spiritual, um, not just physical, the physical answers to those bodies um, that have to be addressed in conjunction or even first. And we can't necessarily do this by ourselves. So the applications that I present in, in my book, radical health makeover, the science and spirituality of self-healing are there to help you start the process and sort of dive in and start to become aware of your thinking of your inner voice of your inner critic, if you will, that's sort of where we notice these subconscious patterns show up constantly. (laughs) They're always going, they're always running, but it's also something that, you know, I have found over the years, and that's why I wrote the book that working with people in a group setting one-on-one face-to-face is something that is so profound and it's so life-changing because we don't become that vulnerable, but while reading a book, you know, mm-hmm. we can do the practices and the meditations and that's wonderful. And we should have a spiritual practice where we become more con- conscious and aware of our self um, and, and cultivate that relationship with our higher self, which is really what this is all about. This is something that doesn't happen when you're isolated by yourself. This is 
the deepest work that we can do. And that requires a witness and it requires even a group. And which is why I love so much um, doing live retreats with people Mm -hmm. because we can all dive into this together in a circle and hold space for one another to witness and move through our own blockages. And it's so profound that you can do years worth of therapy work in one hour with in a group setting when the container is set correctly for this work to be done. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so passionate about doing live retreats where we actually do this work together and people walk away just completely transformed. And you were, you and I were able to do that together and it was really such a beautiful experience. So I really appreciate your courage again, and being willing to keep looking and looking and looking because it's painful. It's very deeply painful because we have to relive the trauma and that's Mm -hmm. how we work through it. That's how we really resolve it within ourselves that we can see it from a different angle when we are an adult working through that same experience again, but being willing to go there is very challenging and really keeps a lot of people stuck. Yeah. And I think the it was great to release the rage and the anger around that as it um, kind of cascaded forward. Because what I realized is that as a child, I was treated as a sex object um, and not as an individual or a human being. And I think like a lot of the weight was put on as a protective mechanism. You know, I went on to do a four, uh, sorry, five, six year medical degree and then another four years in postgraduate research. I could not, I felt, have done that. Being treated as an object, you know, and media had, uh, you know, created this in the, in the 70s as that it's okay for men to treat women like that. You know, even young women, even children, like it stole my childhood. And I was effing enraged when I figured out that this poor little child, this little girl inside me had been occluded by fat for so many years as a protective mechanism. So I couldn't chew, I could really empower myself to become intelligent. And this is a message I want to send out to your listeners is that I'm still not over that rage, but I will transmute and transcend that rage so that other young women and children do not suffer the same way that I did. And that I think is my biggest distillation through this process is that I can be stunningly beautiful and felt and not treated any less or as an object of sexual desire by other individuals who have no self-respect. And that has been the key to unlocking, taking off that last 12 pounds is that I am getting more and more comfortable with what was stolen from me and I'm claiming it back on my terms as an incredibly uber intelligent and bodaciously capable and creative human in my body with my whole um, self in alignment mentally emotionally and physically and connected to beauty whoo yeah that's a big charge right Mm -hmm. there It makes me a little emotional, actually, to hear you say that, Allie. (laughs) Yeah. And, and, you know, darling, me too. And and that's the thing is that, you know, how many other women and children have gone through precisely and padded their locker, their physical, mental, and emotional health and fat between all their organs and their heart and the sugar just keeping it reinforced topping it up periodically just to specifically insulate against what we have, um, you know, billboarded women in magazines for, you know, decades and compromise their capacity to truly be congruent 
with their um, intelligence, their capacities, their wonderful creativity and generative power and their genius. I would say that um, when I think about it, I think the reason that it's so emotional for me is that I think every woman has been through that. Every single woman on the planet yeah. has experienced that on some level. Yeah. Been yeah. hypersexualized as a, and a as an adolescent. Yes. And for a young child to have to bear that burden is extraordinarily devastating. Yeah, well said. Well said. And, and I think, you know, coming to that realization that that was profoundly at my core, you know, the things that I swung the pendulum opposite to was feminism and becoming you know, even uh, a physician and, oh, I've done a PhD and, oh, I've written 25 books. That's a fucking false ego, you know, diatribe. I was compensating. I still compensate for something that was stolen from me very early on in my development. And who knows? Maybe I was really meant to be a watercolor artist or a potter, but I never got a chance to figure out if that's truly who I am meant to be because I'm always been compensating and you know storing the fat on my frame was another aspect of that same gesture you know and it's sad i feel sad and and war torn a, a little like it's going to take me quite a bit of time to find my true center you know, who am I now as, you know, a whole super ninja healthy woman, you know, with not an ounce of fat on my abdomen or thighs, like really, who am I going to be, you know, not as a sex object, but just purely um, apprehending and, and commanding my full, the full Monty of my naturalness, like, I don't know. I, I'm curious as hell. Like, I'm sure I'll be up to having a good whale and sucking my thumb on your porch, you know, still one day or twice, um, you know, stepping on the scales and going, oh my God, that takes the sails, like the wind right out of my sails. Like, fuck, like, who am I now? Mm -hmm. That is amazing. <laughs> and that's the question we get to ask ourselves every day is who, who am I now? why am I doing the things I'm doing and who do I want to be? Those are the curious questions we get to walk around with on a daily basis. Once we remove these layers of weight, mental, emotional, and physical weight that we've been carrying around. And this is enlightenment, you know, this is enlightening. And that is the point. That is the real point of the work that I do and you have done an amazing job of being so curious and really exploring these um, playful spaces within yourself and doing things that are so fun and engaging and really like becoming a kid again. Yeah, well said. And, and that's the thing is that it brings back that element of play. Like I have to go back and get her, you know, that poor, sweet, 12 year old daughter who was cut off from her father who didn't look at her anymore. And I couldn't figure out, you know, what I had done um, because he was my life. You know, he loved, we would roll around and wrestle on the floor together. All of a sudden, you know, no more towel fights because, you know, you might hit the, your 12 year old daughter in the breast and then you open up a whole can of worms, no more, you know, wrestling that's gone you know, the cat calling and, you know, the boy in the Trans Am who um, desired something I didn't really, wasn't in touch with yet, I didn't know. And then being called, oh, your jeans are too tight and you look like a slut and, you know, changing out of the clothes uh, I was wearing in a girlfriend's um, garage so that I could wear what I felt I wanted to wear to school 
you know, early on and being caught by her mother, what are you doing Ch taking, you know, changing her clothes in, in my garage? I mean, these are very painful things that we went through out of survival to try and define identity when the onslaught of persecution really and tyranny and, you know, it, you couldn't develop naturally with all of that coming, you had to develop protective mechanisms in order to cope. And so that has brought me to a place of advocacy through this protocol with you that I never imagined um, would be my vehicle for transcendence because you always have to take the rage or it turns into tumors or heart disease, which is what I tell my own patients that if you don't take that morsel of rage and anger and figure out what its gift and um, you know back to humanity is about, you know now I understand um, to the depths and the fiber of my being the etiology of fat. I was recently in Mexico City during the Women's March, the oh, Women's yeah. Day, and I mean there's some intense rage going on out there, and. I had never really seen it before in a mass group of a couple hundred thousand women that were marching down the street in uh, Mexico city, but it was profound. Mm -hmm. And as I talk to you, it's like, it just goes right back to me thinking, well, no wonder, you know, no wonder women are so angry. Yeah. Well said. My old mentor asked me years ago, why are women so angry? And I said, back to him. How could we not be? you know, really, and, and, and that's the thing is that it doesn't end with women's advocacy, um, you know, with the, the Rockefeller orchestrated women's movement of the 60s. You know, we can't become tribal. We have to become introspective because we cannot transcend as a group of individuals, men and women, unless we are going for deep transformation of our own schisms uh, and trauma and pain. And then we can come together, you know, as true natural individuals, not as a label and, and not as something that's orchestrated as a debt-based economy between men and women to um, you know, further uh, the Rockefeller agenda, which happens to be all the education that individuals get at medical school with only three hours of um, nutrition in their um, uh, curriculum. And so, yes, it has to be personal transformation before we can throw the rope back to individuals who have suffered in ways uh, that are resonant um, with what we have actually transcended in ourselves. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm thinking as I uh, am talking right now, I wrote a book called Unfolding the Essential Self from Rage to Orgastic Potency. I think I need to go back and add a cha chapter, um, you know, in, in this <laughs> realm, because now it's not complete anymore. But isn't that the evolution of our consciousness that, uh, <laughs> you know, we just keep unfolding layers of ourselves and that you know, our blind spots are in our subconscious are not areas that we even know about, um, you know, until it comes up. That's right. Mm -hmm. And as it comes up in our daily life, there's always a new opportunity. And if we stay curious and in that childlike state, really of just child's mind, we can always have an opportunity to learn something and to evolve and to grow and to peel back another layer it's difficult to stay unconscious mm. and it's difficult to become conscious. So yeah. it's not for everyone. I, I just think that ne neither way is easy, you know, yeah. to, to grow spiritually and evolve spiritually. It's, it's extraordinarily painful because we have to go back and we have to revisit very painful events that occurred in our life. They are, they are the rudder that's directing us, whether we know it or not, whether we're aware of it or not. Well and so to, to go back and to really dive into that material is excruciating yeah. and not very many people are going to do it. You know, and those are the people that are going to gain the weight back and they're going to never lose the weight. And they're not going to reach their health goals and they're going to continue to have lots of inflammation and be moody and angry. And 
that's not easy either, you know? No. And I, I always laugh a little bit when people say, oh my God, this, this diet, it's so hard. And, you know, it's, it's uh, all the things, you know, all the, all the negative things you can think about making a change that isn't easy. It's, um, I, I just kind of, you know, have to shrug my shoulders and, and giggle a little bit. And eventually if people stick with it, they'll realize that it's actually a lot easier than what they were doing because it's going to simplify your life in such a huge way. So yeah. And falling in love with yourself is a really nice added benefit. Uh, you know, and that's the thing is that yes, when you actually stand in front of the mirror, you know, or my massage therapist said the other day, as she ran her hands down my side, she goes, Oh, my God, I said, Are you going to charge me half because I'm half the woman that I was. <laughs> Yeah. And and it becomes, like you say, such a source of humor and playfulness and softness. And, and I think that's another thing is that I had always had a measure of tripod rage as a defense, you know, mm -hmm. wanting to kick anything with three legs because my fear of men from an early age was baked into that fat. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a state of stress or rage or anger or frustration or whatever you call that fear essentially it's just a deep rooted fear that lives in us your body cannot heal itself because oh. you're in this state of fight or flight and you have these stress hormones raging through your body all the time i mean just walking downtown you can feel that sometimes depending on what cars driving by and what cat calls are being you know blurted at you and whatnot. If we're walking around in that triggered state, our physiology is in survival mode. Yeah. And we cannot get to those deeper layers of healing that need to happen. These things take so much time. You know, you, you don't heal overnight. And so how can we continue this journey if we're clenching and in fear and having all this cortisol and adrenaline surging through our body all the time? and not sleeping well, it's just a snowball effect. And the, one of the first things we have to do is to calm the nervous system down. Mm -hmm. And you have modeled that so beautifully and your in your willingness to just keep, keep peeling back the layers and going deeper and deeper into this process. And so it's just such a beautiful thing to see, Allie. <laughs> Thank you. It's been an honor <laughs> to work with you and like I say really unfold my essential self through the process and you know bump into those really hard places and have you um, really help to trigger to bring them them out uh, you know both on the physical level and the mental emotional and spiritual level I'm a much um, more um, I would say sweet and soft and um, beautiful person inside and out as a result of this work that I have had the honor of doing with you. So thank you so much. And I wish all of those individuals that you serve the same, you know, blessed journey um, to be able to, you know, go to the physical, come back to the emotional, get back to the physical and, you know, go into the spiritual and hit that, that emotional thing and back into the physical. And it's, this is how I kind of um, saw it was some kind of really amazing uh, dynamic process that had me toggling between these gestures um, that enabled me really to apprehend and leverage um, you know, the dirty gnarly bits uh, down at my core. Um, because yeah, then the, the weight and the food starts to matter less and less and less and less uh, as you go. And you just kind of like instinctually eat, which I can't even tell you what that feels like, that I'm actually full Mm -hmm. And I know I'm full and I'm going to put the other half of the, that eggs and the fish cakes I made into a container and put it in the fridge. Maybe I'll want it later. Mm -hmm. But I've never had that capacity in my whole life. And because, you know, my trauma was very early on with my biological mother committing suicide. I was mothered by a family that never spoke about that trauma after it happened ever again. 
-hmm. was never spoken of. So how was I loved by my aunts, my cousins, my grandmothers through food? Mm. And they would give me, oh, anything I wanted, tang. I I mean, we come back in from, you know, haying um, during the summer months. You can have anything you want. Do you want chocolate cake and vanilla cake and ice cream with that after your overcooked beef and potatoes? I mean, I was raised to be um, a sugar addict. And, and that, even though, you know, I had become a physician 21 years ago in natural health, I had aborted all of that way of being in the world. I still craved it. Mm. And I didn't own my process truly. I didn't own my process truly because it still called to me like a siren in the waves. Come, mm. you know, if you're a good girl. And Mm. if you do enough work and serve everybody else and look after your kids and keep that anger at bay, and if you tone down that tripod rage, oh, you can have some dark chocolate before, you know, in the evening when nobody knows. I could say that this is just a theme that is so, so common that we are rewarded often in our childhood with a treat. And especially if there's trauma or guilt as the parents have experienced, they want to ease their own guilt and give something to the child that's going to temporarily make them feel good. Right. And this is what I grew up with too. You know, I remember coming home from kindergarten, eating, you know, at least a row of Oreos, maybe two Yeah. (laughs) and having, you know, chocolate milk and all the things watching cartoons. I mean, all the things I, that, that was the, that was a daily after school snack for me was yeah. ice cream and Oreos and uh, what was it? Cereal and milk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know, I lived on that for, for many years and even to this day, I will still catch myself saying to myself, you, you deserve a treat. Yeah. Even, even to this day, you know, mm-hmm. it's never going to go away. Yeah. Well, that said. little embedded ingrained program in there is always going to try to play itself and it will. And yeah. it's up to that higher self, that wise self, that true self, soul self, whatever you want to call it, that develops the capacity to recognize that and to say, ha ha, you know, you're not going to pull that over on me or whatever you say to um, address that inner voice is something that we develop during this process. And it's kind of the thing that nobody's really talking about. And that's yeah, why yes. I think that this interview is going to help so many people, Allie, because this is the thing that nobody's talking about. And this is why I wrote the book that I did, yeah. because I want people to know that before they change their diet, the first thing you have to do is change your mind. Yeah. And otherwise, you know, you 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 just don't see that you're being run by something that isn't you and that does not have your best interest in mind. Well said. And, and, you know, I, I know that you and I have raised our children differently. And and I think that's the thing is that I ran an experiment with my babes. um, And I really wanted to see, I mean, my son will be 28 um, next, well, this month, actually in a few days. Oh, wow. I did send him a present, so don't worry about that. And I will call him. But that's the most amazing thing to me is that he's an athlete and, you know, a bone practitioner and, um, you know, somebody who was an acrobat uh, for many, many years, did parkour, taught parkour, like bought his body and where he is in space and time has always been super important and critical to him. And he ate based on the basis of instinct so interesting. I mean, he raised himself on burgers and eggs. That was really, you know, grass-fed lamb and, you know, uh, raw milk. That was how he was raised. And he has an instinct, not just uh, following what is being taught or told. He has an instinct intact. And I'm like, wow, where do you get one of those? Like, that's an amazing thing to watch unfold naturally. And my daughter, who um, will be 25 um, in January, 
same thing. She would say, you know, mom, I have your body type and I tend to put on weight if I'm not watching and I'm just going to take breakfast out for the next couple of weeks and I'll come back to factory settings. And I'm just like, wow, where do you get one of those? You know, I really would like to learn how to manage my metabolism like that. And of course, now I finally have it. And my kids are just in awe, like you, they're just like, mom, you're rocking it. You're so awesome. Like, look how, you, like, you're more beautiful than you ever were before. And Aww. wow, like, you really have this capacity. I'm like, I earned it by watching you, you know, unfold naturally. And I was smart enough not to get in your way to say, no, you can't have that. Or you can have this that I allowed them to learn how to self-manage their own metabolism. What a gift. And so, yeah, to be, uh, you know, 59 this year and finally get the keys to the kingdom where I have that capacity as well is such a gift. It's like I've come full karmic circle to obtain that ability mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. How a freaking Luya. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but wow. no, it's not been easy. You did earn it. And I'm wondering <laughs> if you could share a little bit about when you had the moment where you said that you can now um, eat half the plate and you're fine to just put it away for later. What, what do you attribute that to? I, well, that's a great question. And maybe you can help me in the moment sort that through that, because you know, when I sit down, because my endocrine system now is in a state of balance, because I am toggling between, yes, I, you know, went to the Thai restaurant on Friday night, but I still lost two pounds because I didn't eat, um, you know, all my meals for the rest of the weekend. I knew that I was going to have that bit of um, fun and be able to pull back um, and, and, come back into um, keto very rapidly. I really think that I've learned to be a metabolizing ninja Mm -hmm. as a result of pulling back, giving her, pulling back, giving her, you know, and that I can, I own this process Mm -hmm. now. Whereas before I felt um, out of control and victimized by my needs that kept coming up out of my subconscious realm. So all of a sudden I'm noticing I have something called a fullness trigger. Wow, what a concept. Normal and healthy people have always had that. My kids have that, your kids have that. I didn't know what that looked or felt like because I was always stuffing down. You know, Wilhelm Reich talks about the oral block. Well, that's smoking, uh, overeating, you know, and I was always stuffing the emotion down in my nether girl, you know, because I was afraid or terrified of that um, rage, anger, fear, guilt, Mm -hmm. shame, resentment, all of the whole host and bucket of emotions that we keep down um, in our nether man. And and that's the thing is that neurosis uh, is operated up here, trying to keep that pinioned below decks well if it starts to come loose and start to manipulate us the first thing we do is smoke or drink or grab some chocolate or you know food of some sort well that takes our ability away to sense those uh, triggers when I'm done Mm. and so I didn't know because getting up this recent content has meant that I don't need to keep pushing shit down Um, that I'm not prepared to look at, because it's up, it's out. And now I sense I'm full. And I think it's a thing of beauty. I almost wanted to sing out and as maybe I'll be an opera star, because now I sing (laughs) when I notice that I'm full, which is just a thing of grace to me, like, wow, that that's normal. That's what that feels like. Never knew it. Never Um, knew it. This is again, just such a profound example of how the mind and body work together, how the emotional body, the physical, physical body work together. And there's no separating these things. So if there's a blockage, if there's something that's not working and you're not getting the results that you want, 
you have to look in the corners, in the dark corners and, and shine the light in all of these places. And eventually, as you practice these things over time, over and over, day after day after day, they, they do sink in and they do stick. And you will start to see and have these experiences like you had at the restaurant, like, wow, I'm full. I'm going to put this in the to-go box and take it with me for tomorrow or whatever. The pieces just start to fall into place as you practice these things over time. And it does take time and commitment and you have paid your dues and you now are able to balance these things and keep this balance going, which is so amazing. And I think that's really the point of the work that I do with people and that you do with people is to get them to be able to be their own um, governor or monitor Mm -hmm. in these ways. And this is what's possible for everybody listening, that you are in control of your emotions and of your habits and of your desires. And you're able to reach amazing uh, goals and, and peaks and highlights and amazing pinnacles in your life that were not possible before Mm -hmm. because all these things were blocking you in, in, in the way. And so thank you for illuminating the amazing tie of the mind body connection, essentially. Such my pleasure. Yo, and, and it's, it's fun to be chased by my husband, even though, you know, he's always loved me with every fiber of his being. I could be 300 pounds. He would still come for me Sunday afternoons. I mean, it's just that we're baked in and, you know, that's helped a lot. He has never said, you know, you're more beautiful now or triggered that um, thing. Like uh, find your support system that operate from a state of integrity mm-hmm. you know and don't re-trigger yourself being with people that actually bring that content up until you're ready to release it in a safe place I can't reiterate that enough and and that's the thing is you know I get off the scales or something in the morning and I'm walking across the room uh, with my undies on only and my hubs goes oh my God, you're so stunningly beautiful, you know, and it's so adorable because he's also lost 30 pounds. Um, And, you know, just from eating how I'm eating and just, you know, kind of following uh, and, you know, picking up his pace with his own running and, you know, uh, he's like so um, loving and supportive and never has treated me like an object and never will. And I have to say, like to bring kudos to my beloved husband that was a big part of being able to let go and hit in on that content is that I'm loved and nurtured as myself as an intelligent woman in a beautiful body no matter if I had weight on or not and have always been super fit you know like it was nothing for me to rock 17 kilometers on the trail about 12 miles Um, on a weekend, even with 35 pounds on extra, my kids always called me the little bull. You know, I was always super strong, but I just could not get to the bottom of this well of weight until recently. And again, just like there's nobody more curious than I am now, I think, because I'm really, you know, after somebody's died, you're like a raw nerve. And you live so much in the moment because I don't know who I am wholly in this state of grace. I'm learning so much about myself as a whole and normal and healthy and fully um, beautiful woman because I've always carried weight on my frame since I was 16 years of age. Mm. You know, so to be to have you and to have friends and my children and my husband surrounding me with so much love that we love you no matter who you are and what you look like enabled me to be able to dissolve and shed that weight in a safe environment um, where, you know, nurturing and care and emotional integrity have been key. Mm. That really speaks to the concept that our environment is constantly reflecting back to us and 
affecting our physiology in such a profound way, emotional and physical, um, in our emotional and physical body. So I, again, I do talk a lot about this in my book as well, that mm -hmm. we have to rearrange our environment. And if you're around people that aren't reflecting back to you, those, you know, things that you want to create more of in your life, then you have to take drastic measures sometimes to rearrange your environment. Mm -hmm. So important. And you have a loving, supportive environment around you. So everything is just teeing you up to be able to do this. And I also just want to reiterate that you can't run this weight off. You can't work at the gym mm -hmm. to get this weight off. No, and I so appreciate you validating and reiterating that as well, because it's so critical and crucial. Like a lot of patients actually use exercise to armor themselves under deck. I mean, you've heard of uh, a, a runner, a marathon runner, actually get to the, the finish line and have a heart attack. Well, that is an issue of inflammation that's under decks which actually is caused from the striations in the muscles that keep all that emotion under decks. And that's the thing, mine showed up as fat, but it could have just as easily shown up as, you know, over musculature to hold all of that content at bay. And you know, you've served, uh, I'm sure athletes as well. It's like, whoa, wait a second, there's something missing here. Something that's not properly threaded through all of their bodies, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, something's not right. And we know, you know, athletes who love sugar like crazy, it's like, yeah, that's causing inflammation. It's only a matter of time before it shows up. What's the mental, emotional, or miasmic, the genetic miasm that's coming down the family line that's contributing to this trauma for this person? Because if that's the default, then, you know, do we eat to live or do we live to eat? Even if we're really slim and really fit, we still have, you know, that content puppeting us down in our nether man that needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Yeah. The ketogenic diet is, is for everyone that wants to optimize their health, whether they're overweight or not. Yeah. And it, it's such a profound practice because it allows us to go into a state of autophagy or autophagy where we're actually cleaning house and doing a deep detoxification. And this doesn't happen until we allow our metabolism to do what it was designed to do, which is to mm -hmm. run off of two fuel sources, both fat and glucose. And once you reach your goal weight, there's a whole nother thing that has to happen. And of course, you and I will have this conversation very soon, uh, but things do need to change. And it's a dynamic process and it's something that's contextual and it's different mm -hmm. for every single person that does it because everyone has a different reason for wanting to optimize their health and they have different goals that they, that they want to meet. Maybe somebody has uh, an autoimmunity or they have digestive issues or they have ex excess weight they're carrying, whatever the thing is, it could be even a mental illness or anxiety, mm -hmm. depression, ADD, ADHD, uh, schizophrenia, seizures. These are all great reasons to embrace a dietary change, a lifestyle change, um, and really looking at the deeper layers that contributed to that uh, breakdown in the first place. And so I'm excited to work with anyone who's brave enough to go there. Yeah, <laughs> and, <I understood. laughs> and so I want to honor your time today, Allie, and thank you so much again for sharing. This has been such an enriching process. And I know that so many people are going to learn amazing, inspiring things from what you've shared. Not that it's the right thing for everybody, but I just want to take a moment. My son, Jordan was in the autism spectrum, which is how I came to the system of medicine that I practice. Um, if you want to look more into Heilkunst, the website where I trained was www.heilkunst.com, H-E-I-L-K-U-N-S-T. Um, my website is www.arcanum.ca, arcanum being A-R-C-A-N-U-M as in mother. 
So that's how you can um, reach out if you want to stay in touch with me. But Jordan went on a GAPS diet with a lot of probiotics and so much of his health came back. And, you know, uh, by resolving the trauma of his vaccine injury, uh, along with the genetic predisposition to those disease matrix, we were really able to get to the root cause. And he came back online, Mary. It was like a gift from God I never imagined that diet contributed so much. And then of course, I started to really do a lot of research in that realm, uh, as you also have um, 25 years ago. The other thing that I just, um, in practical terms, what it came down for, and some of the greatest things that you furnished me with that made such a huge difference to my day-to-day -day life was that bone broth calmed my nervous system in ways that's indescribable. In six months that I have been on this journey with you, I have never not had broth in my crock pot. Just to be clear, it is always there because if I falter or if I feel sad or if I feel like I don't have sca scaffolding or I've chosen to do a fast for 24 or 36 hours that day, the bone broth is like my mama. Like mm. I so rely on it to hold me in good stead. So that's an oxtail bone broth is my favorite, just to be clear. The other thing that I love so much are the bone marrows, the long, we call them chuitano here in Mexico. It's the long bones. That was the other thing that you got me on very early on. And just to take a spoon and scoop out a well-seasoned marrow bone, beef bone, long bone, yeah, can start angels singing within my metabolism and body. The other thing too, is just making sure I have enough and a lot of salt. I was the type of person that had a lot of leg cramps uh, early on. And if I wasn't getting enough water or salt, then I could be woken in the middle of the night with my toes balling up and just like a uh, leg cramp from the foot all the way up the calf into my thigh, absolutely excruciating. So just to be mindful that on this approach, um, you know, especially working with Mary, she'll tell you, make sure you're getting enough minerals in your diet. The other thing that you put us on was the magnesium citrate, which has helped so much. And we still like order that like a boss, um, you know, so magnesium citrate and the potassium citrate has helped so much. Um, butter, I order it by the pounds, uh, not just pound, pounds. It lives in my fridge, yellow and golden and beautiful. And so when I scoop out to cook things uh, into my pan that does not have Teflon in it, um, there's either uh, pork fat or butter in that pan before I fry up that well-seasoned steak uh, with some onions and mushrooms now. So super delicious. Eggs, we order them by the skid, just to be clear. Um, you know, because eggs are a mainstay for us. I'm now getting a, a bit of cheese cream. We order it also by the bucket. Um, and that goes into my matcha tea, my fat matcha in the morning with all my fats and all of my tallow because I'm rendering back fat. Who would ever thought? Um, and putting that into my, um, you know, and it, it, the awesome thing is about those drinks in the morning is I don't have to eat till one or two in the afternoon. And that means that, that I'm really carried through the day, fully supported without the illusion of the scaffolding falling out from underneath me um, during the course of the day. So follow Mary. Mary is your, your keto guru. She'll take good care of you. Take uh, you know, come to the retreats in Mexico that she's planning because I happen to be a little bird on her wall. I hear what kinds of things she's up to. Read her book for sure, for sure, for sure. She's actually coming on Monday the 25th to speak to my whole professional association. One of my colleagues has even written a book on keto, uh, which I actually um, wrote introductions to her other books. So yeah, we're taking it all to a whole other level. Uh, mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually. So thank you for the work that you've done and the research that you've done. Mary. Oh, thank you, Allie, so much. And I will put the links to those um, places where people can find you, Allie, in the notes. So people can be sure to, to find them there and look yeah. you up if, if that feels 
like they're called to do so. And I so appreciate you in so many ways. And thank you for sharing your beautiful story with everyone. Such my pleasure. Yeah. What an honor to hang out with you as always, sister, (laughs) in any capacity. for Uh. sure. You can find me at ketogenicdietcoach.com where you can find out more about my program called Radical Health Makeover. This will help you get keto adapted so you can live your life more fully. This is a one-year mastery course that includes private coaching sessions with me that you can actually start today. You are not a victim of your genetic code. If you're looking to reverse symptoms of leaky gut, chronic inflammatory conditions, autoimmunity, cancer, or if you just want to maximize your athletic performance or age more gracefully, training your metabolism to burn fat for fuel instead of just carbohydrates is a powerful strategy. I encourage you to pick up a copy of my book, Radical Health Makeover, The Science and Spirituality of Self-Healing, which will give you a solid foundation for taking control of your health. In it, I've outlined specific strategies that you must take with your diet as well as important daily practices that will help you to leverage the power of your mind in your healing process. You'll also find my free ebook that you can download called How to Start a Keto Diet the Right Way, the three must-do steps for success, along with my free five-day keto challenge that will teach you everything you need to know about tracking your progress. This is crucial for being successful with a keto diet. You have to learn how to track your biometrics and so that you can learn the language of your body. I know this sounds daunting, but I will walk you through this whole process and I will simplify it for you and help you to avoid the common pitfalls and problems that I see so often that people are making that's really derailing them from having success. I don't want that to happen to you. So do reach out to me on my website. You can send me a message. And let me know how I can support you on your keto journey.